Good morning and welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney where markets have just come online. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. We're counting down to Asia's major trading opens. The top stories this hour. Asian stocks set for a positive open after Wall Street ended last week at record highs, despite further Fed pushback on imminent interest rate cuts. Ron DeSantis drops out of the U.S. presidential race and endorses Donald Trump, making Tuesday's New Hampshire primary a two-horse race between the former president and Nikki Haley. Plus, Australian software firm Canva said to be close to completing a $1.5 billion share sale as it ramps up its competition with Adobe. Well, we've just opened for trade here in Australia. It is, of course, difficult to get a read on things in the early going here. We do have a staggered open, of course, but we are positive, modestly, by a few points uh, at the moment. New Zealand's been trading for a little while, though, uh, seeing a little bit of uh, positivity there, better by a tenth of 1%. And, of course, this is following on from a very positive finish to the week for U.S. markets. If we uh, take a look at uh, the yields uh, on the 10-year here in Australia, well, that's been creeping up pretty much over the past week. Right now, 4.26. Uh, the Aussie dollar lost a bit of ground towards the end of last week. We did have uh, reasonably encouraging jobs figures. The Aussie right now uh, just below 66 cents US. As we look ahead to the open in Japan, well, the Nikkei's been charging ahead recently. It's just about 100 points shy of a record at the moment. And uh, futures for Japan right now also in positive territory uh, for the Nikkei. Uh, if we take a look at the yen also, well, that's pretty weak. It's probably uh, supporting equity prices to a pretty large degree and about 148.26 at the moment. Yeah, and of course, what's really been driving that yen weakness has been the differential between the the Fed and also the BOJ. There's expectations around policy, and uh, this this estimation coming through from Wall Street still that the Fed will be forced to cut rates was the big theme for stocks in the Friday close. So we saw really big moves coming through in the Nasdaq, and you're continuing to see futures there pointing higher. The S&P 500 IT index or tech index also hitting a record uh, or two-year high. Rather, for that, but the focus really as well coming back down to what we're seeing in the bond space because it's been that pullback we've seen in Treasury volatility. So it's also helping uh, traders position for risk on Wall Street. Oil, it's pretty sensitive to, to those expectations around Fed rate cuts, plus uh, what's happening in the Red Sea. And we can get more on that in just a moment. But we are watching uh, Brent crude there, the, the start of trade for Monday, just fractionally weaker here. The question, of course, for investors going into to this week is whether that data we're going to be getting, including the Fed's favourite inflation measure, how that's going to stack up against what we're hearing from policymakers. So if we get any small pushback on the urgency to cut rates because we continue to hear that Fed chorus from policymakers, including from the San Francisco Fed president, Mary Daly. We don't want to loosen policy too quickly, only to find that inflation gets stuck at way above target. That would be a miss. That would be a very scarring miss. And we don't want to try to get to two so quickly like overnight, just to get that squeezed out, that we end up having this big run up in the unemployment rate. Well, let's get to the uh, big political news of the hour. Of course, uh, Ron DeSantis dropping out of the 2024 U.S. presidential race. He's endorsing Donald Trump, who's now going to face off with Nikki Haley in Tuesday's New Hampshire primary. And I am today suspending my campaign. I'm proud to have delivered on 100% of my promises. And I will not stop now. It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee, and I will honor that pledge. He has my endorsement because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear. Well, for more, we're joined by Washington senior editor Wendy Benjaminson in New Hampshire. Uh, Wendy, Ron DeSantis, of course, hugely popular in Florida. That didn't really translate to the national stage, though. Why not? What happened? 
Well, his campaign was sort of beset from trouble with troubles from the start. He um, had some organizational problems, staff problems, and then he he avoided mainstream media. He stuck to conservative outlets, and the the sort of negative feelings about him just kept growing. And then, really, it's very difficult for any Republican right now to beat Donald Trump. We'll see if Nikki Haley can pull it off tomorrow night, but at the moment, she is still behind in the polls. And he really was just sort of Trump without the Trump personality um, in many ways. Um, and he turned off Wall Street with a lot of his anti-corporate, um, you know, behavior, anti-corporate positions. And so I think it was just a campaign that was that was doomed after a after a promising start. So where does that leave Nikki Haley then in particular? Because if you're now a two-horse race between Donald Trump and then, and then Haley on the other side, the people that had been backing Ron DeSantis, where are they most likely to turn to, do you think? Well, it looks like almost everyone is turning to Donald Trump as the inevitable uh, Republican nominee at this point. There are still, Haley does have backers. Um, there was a group called Americans for Prosperity that was spoke to us today about their support for Nikki Haley. That is backed by Charles Koch, one of the uh, huge political donor. Um, there, the governor, Chris Sununu, here in New Hampshire, supports Nikki Haley. And what will if she wins, it will be with the support of Democrats and independents who decide tomorrow night to register temporarily as Republicans, which you can do in New Hampshire, vote in the primary for her. And um, as but that is more as a stop Donald Trump movement than it is necessarily a pro Nikki Haley movement. So she's right now the latest polls are showing Trump with 50 percent, her with 39 percent. So she has a little room to make up if she's going to pull it out tomorrow. Or Tuesday, excuse me. Uh, Wendy, this is a pretty different setup to what we saw in 2016 as well, where there was a very crowded Republican field. Now, before Super Tuesday, we're just down to two. Is that going to make things different this time around? Well, it just makes Donald Trump's ascension to the nomination again more inevitable. I mean, in 2016, people didn't really know who he was, and some Republicans were willing to take a chance on him. And they, you know, were hearing his speeches carried live on CNN all the time. And he was sort of a novelty, um, and people voted for him then. Um, and also, Hillary Clinton, the Democratic nominee, wasn't that popular a nominee. And we're there again with the Democrats. And so, yes, it just means that the primary season, if he does as well as he is expected to on Tuesday night here in New Hampshire, the primary season is pretty much over. All right, Bloomberg's Washington senior editor, Wendy Benjamins in the New Hampshire there with the news of Ron DeSantis dropping out of the Republican primaries. Well, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected what he says are unacceptable terms presented by Hamas to release its remaining hostages. Uh, let's get more from Bloomberg's Michael Heath here in Sydney now. Michael, really no appetite at all from uh, Netanyahu to uh, reach some kind of peace agreement. What's his problem? No, um, well, the, the argument from this uh... Um, from the Israeli government at the moment is that they have to win the war in, in order to release the hostages. Now, one of their um, members of the, of the war cabinet has broken ranks and said the reality is if you're going to release the hostages, you need a deal. So um, there, <clears throat> there is a bit of division there. There's obviously also talks still going on behind the scenes. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that the US, Egypt and Qatar uh, are working on a proposal that would phase an end to the war. But, uh, yes, look, there's not a lot of um, public movement at this stage anyway. <clears throat> and then there's also what's happening in, in the Red Sea, and, and we're also just getting more of a sense of how long it could possibly take to, to stop these ship, ship attacks from Houthi militants. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the, the, there just doesn't seem to be any progress. I mean, the, the US and the UK have been um, have been attacking the uh, the sites of the of the Houthi missiles. Uh, there was an interdiction of an Iranian ship. Obviously, Iran is the key backer and supplier of the Houthis there. But it, it, there doesn't seem to be any let up at this stage. The US is saying it's going to take time. Um, how long that takes is is uh, unknown. I mean, th these are fairly wild areas we're talking about, etc. And there's no troops on the ground or anything like that. So it's really all being 
being done um, aerially by surveillance or that sort of thing. So really it's just, yeah, it is a matter of time and, and it's going to take time after that to regain the confidence of the, you know, maritime companies, etc., to, to use that. So, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, on both fronts, there's not a lot of movement, there's not a lot of positivity to, to report. Um, we just seem to be stuck in this in this same rut at this stage, um, which, yes, is, 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 is uh, it's a concerning issue, definitely, um, whether it's from world trade or, or whether it's from uh, civilian casualties in, in Gaza. Yeah, and that risk of horse that it just continues to develop into a, a wider regional conflict. All right, uh, Michael Heath, thanks for your time there. That was Bloomberg's Michael Heath in Sydney. Uh, turning now to China, and we've got most economists expecting lenders there to keep their loan prime rates steady on Monday. That was after the PBOC's surprise hold of the NLF last week. Uh, meanwhile, gloom over Chinese assets, it's spreading beyond stocks, and investors are now expecting the yuan and government bonds to underperform over the course of this year. So let's get more on that now and bring in our China economy editor, Jill Desis. Jill, the Chinese economy is really in the doldrums here. So you, the expectation as well coming into this year that we would be forced to see some sort of major economic stimulus. So the actions from the PBOC last week, whether that's followed by the Chinese lenders today, we do often see that being the case. How is that likely to sort of stack up against what is the fundamental issues in the Chinese economy? Yes, well, I think that at this point today, it's pretty widely expected, as you said, that these prime rates are going to be kept on hold. Remember, while these are uh, set by major banks in China and announced by the PBOC, obviously, whatever the PBOC does with its key policy rates does have some sway over that. We have seen some asymmetric cuts in the past where uh, maybe the, the, the PBOC cuts one way on policy rates and maybe the LPRs are um, a, a bit of a, a tighter shave there. But ultimately, we're not really seeing something where we see a cut versus a hold for the PBOC. So I think that's why you see that, um, that expectation unfolding today. The fact of the matter, though, is that the, the Chinese economy is, as you said, under a lot of pressure. But the reason why we're not seeing a ton of room for easing here is that, one, uh, the PBOC doesn't have a ton of room to actually cut rates a whole lot further. There's a lot of concerns about how that's affecting net interest margins for banks, which were at record lows last year. Uh, as we've also seen some volatility within the UN, um, you know, some concern about whether that uh, could potentially unfold further. And then obviously the divergence in those po the, the rates with what the Fed is doing is another major concern here. I mean, as we uh, saw the Fed's aggressive easing or hiking cycle take off, over the past couple of years, the PBOC was actually cutting rates, and that's created a large divergence there that leaves them without a ton of room to move a lot further. So even as we get into this year, expecting at least some stimulus, we have gotten clues from policymakers that nothing will be incredibly massive. Uh, Jill, of course, we've seen Chinese stocks take a real beating over the past few months. Uh, is that bearish sentiment now starting to, to broaden out to other assets as well? Yeah, so it does seem that in addition to that really impacting the yuan a little bit further, we're also seeing that way on uh, Chinese government bonds as well. I think at this point, um, we're looking at a lot of these economic indicators that have come out of China within uh, just the past couple of weeks. And it's really sort of, um, you know, continuing that narrative of uh, this economy is not really through a lot of these major issues that they continue to face. Uh, deflationary pressures in particular remain a very critical concern going into 2024. For the Chinese economy, the property sector also continues to show a lot of signs of weakness, and I think that's really weighing on sentiment here. Also point you to uh, the continued outflows um, in terms of uh, the, the lack of interest in foreign investors really getting into China. Uh, we just saw some recent data from the Ministry of Commerce that last week show us that uh, FDI, uh, by one measurement in China, fell to a three-year low, so there's just not a ton of optimism about getting into China more broadly right now. All right, China economy editor Jill Desis there. Thanks very much. Still to come, Japan welcomed 25 million tourists in 2023. That's the largest number since 2019. We'll get more analysis on that with Agoda later in the hour. First, though, we'll get an outlook on markets and why Walls of Wealth Management thinks 2024 is going to be a very eventful year. This is Bloomberg.
Let's take a look now at the week ahead. We do have a number of central bank decisions due. Let's start with the Bank of Japan on Tuesday. Bloomberg Economics sees the BOJ likely to stand pat, with Governor Kazuo Ueda maintaining a holding pattern until clearer signals on the size of wage increases for 2024 start to emerge. Meanwhile, the ECB holds its first monetary policy meeting of 2024. That's on Thursday. President Christine Lagarde told us at Davos that the European Central Bank's likely going to cut rates later this year. Other rate decisions we're going to be watching will be in Canada, Sri Lanka and Malaysia. We've got other economic data to note as well. In just a few hours, as we've been discussing, we're going to get China's loan prime rates. And in the U.S., we're watching for data from the Fed's preferred inflation measure on Friday, as well as fourth quarter GDP figures. And for earnings this week, Netflix and Tesla are expected to report record quarterly revenues. Although Tesla's profitability does continue to be hit by vehicle price cuts, we'll also watch earnings from ASML and SK Hynix amid renewed optimism in the global chip industry. That is your week ahead. Yeah, well, Paul, let's stick with that outlook for tech because our next guest says that the sector, Magnificent Seven in particular, both very volatile in the early weeks of 2024. So shaping up as well to be a very eventful year. Joining us is Rebecca Walser, president of Walser Wealth Management. Rebecca, thanks so much for your time. So uh, the opportunities really becoming tougher to, to find now. Absolutely, Annabelle. I mean, I think the investors going into 2024 were ahead of the skis already, expecting, you know, 150 basis point cut over six times, even though the dot plot for the Fed only showed three. And so you, you kind of had, uh, you know, the investors rotating to long duration assets like tech, like bonds, expecting that obviously they buy in with higher yields. And as the Fed cut, their yields would go up. And it's actually the opposite because now the market is seeing, oh, we got ahead of ourselves. We might pull back, especially with the EC be saying, hey, we're not even looking to do anything until summer, June time frame. Um, so I was basically saying last December that there's no way I don't think we're going to get a March cut because the ECB and the UK's CPI print, their equivalent, wouldn't even come till April. So it put a lot of pressure on the Fed to cut first, and that is not a position they like to be in. A lot of the moves, though, in tech have really been predicated on this expectation that that AI would deliver these huge productivity gains and boost the company's bottom lines. Are we going to see that playing out at all, or, or is that going to be something that really continues to drive strength in the, in that sector? You know, it's a really mixed bag right now, Annabelle, because it is the fourth industrial revolution. We are moving to AI, and there is massive revolution of jobs and uh, um, quantum computing with AI that is going to come as well as the blockchain. So we are in this fourth industrial revolution, but I think for 2024, it is going to be more of a central bank macro story, even though we do expect AI to bring about long-term, uh, you know, compounded growth that we haven't seen really since the dot-com. So I, I, it is a great AI story and investors should be prepared for long-term runway growth here. And even the short-term, although it, it will take time for the technologies to actually be delivering profit. So it's going to be kind of like unicorns that don't actually have revenue like Tesla initially and, and all of those things that had to get monetized. So it's going to be a longer road, but it is the fourth industrial revolution. It is here. However, 2024 is going to be still how do these central banks deal and really deliver a soft landing after all of the stimulus of 2020. This is uncharted territory. We have never been here before. Any economist that says they know how it's going to go and it's fine and we're in this soft landing. They do not know what they're talking about because we've never had this happen before. And that's why we keep getting mixed data and the Fed and the central banks of the world have to keep pulling back what maybe the market expects them to do. Yeah, Rebecca, I want to come back to that AI issue in a moment. But just to your point on central banks there, we've had a lot of strong data out of the US recently. Markets continue to push higher. You've got to ask yourself, does the economy really need these rate cuts or are we in a situation where good news is actually good news again? Yeah, it's a great point, Paul. I mean, if you look at the Atlanta's uh, GP, GDP now, their estimate for fourth quarter GDP is 2.4% annualized. So that is a far cry of where the central bank normally is when they're feeling like it's in time for them to cut rates. You add that to the CPI uptick that we saw, you know, we got 0.3% uh, uh, month over month for December that beat consensus, which is 0.2. And then we've got 3.4% annualized when we, the consensus was 32 
so you had slight CPI tick up. We know that's mostly shelter costs. We understand that. But when you've got CPI ticking up, you've got 2.4% annualized GDP growth, inflation adjusted, and, and then you have, you know, retail sales in December. Until you get some kind of massive economic weakness showing, it's going to be really hard for the Fed to be ahead of the rest of the world in cutting rates. And the market is starting to realize that. And that's why you saw bond yields tick up this past week, because Christopher Waller came out and said, these are not the conditions under which the Fed normally loosens and, uh, and, and you know, stimulates uh, the Fed funds rate at, at a, at a lower rate. Well, I guess we could imagine a scenario where the economy might need support, and that comes back to that AI question again. If it is, as you describe, and as many do, uh, this is the fourth industrial revolution, you've got to expect a bit of creative destruction that goes along with that. Uh, are there uh, yes. any parts of the economy that are particularly at risk, any stocks you're avoiding as well? <laughs> oh, well, unfortunately, uh, this industrial revolution is, is the one that is going to change the face of human capital as we know it. There are so many people that think that this is just a blue collar situation. You're just going to go into your fast food restaurant. It's going to be all robotized. But it is completely beyond that. Obviously, we're talking about drivers universally potentially losing uh, positions. Blue collar, yes. But we're also talking about, you know, you just chop GPT, for example. We've already had lawyers in the United States submit briefs that have been completely generated by ChatGPT, this AI source. So when you have all of the data of the United States, all of the court cases into a singular database and you say, hey, draw, draft me in a brief uh, pleading these arguments using these case laws, I mean, everything eventually will come down to can it be robotized, systematized through AI more efficiently and effectively than human capital. And so this is the shifting of human uh, working as we know it. And of course, every industry will be impacted by that. Something else that can impact every industry is just black swan events. I mean, COVID, of course, being the most recent. But when you're in a situation where you've got uh, two wars that are underfoot, you've got a host of elections over the course of this year, including the U.S., of course, tensions between China and Washington. What geopolitical risk is standing out most to you and how much are you pricing as well for any sort of unknowns? Great question, Annabelle. You know, so I would say, obviously, that we are certainly concerned about the uh, Middle East and the geopolitical risk there, especially getting shipments through that area, any kind of additional stress in that area, additional escalation. You know, the United States administration just reclassified the Houthis in that uh, Middle East area as terrorists again, so that military intervention could actually begin on the U.S. side to protect whatever needs to be protected there. But you've got that situation. You still have Ukraine, Russia not resolved. You have potentially a tai Taiwan Chinese escalation sometime this year. And so we have all of these things happening in the middle of a presidential election year. It's, it's a lot. Investors should expect a bumpy year. Mm -hmm. All right. Rebecca Walser, president at Walser Wealth Management. Thanks so much for joining us with your insights. We have plenty more to come on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. disinformation or misinformation uh, and election interference is going to be a real challenge uh, that we all have to tackle. We are talking too much about Donald Trump uh, in, in Europe and uh, we should um, be prepare ourselves for a possible second term um, for Donald Trump by fostering our European competitiveness. The best um, defense, if that's the way we want to look at it, is, is attack. And to attack properly, you need to be strong at home. So being strong means having a strong, deep market, having a real single market. We've now got two trillion dollar uh, deficits uh, with no end in sight. I don't know that the country, frankly, is prepared for four more years of that because uh, those things all poll very negatively. And I think it's going to be a bumpy year, but most more than anything else, we've got to be resilient. We've got to be prepared to react to news. I think the path is uh, probably that inflation has passed. They're going to start lowering at some point. When they're ready, they're going to be prudent. They're going to be thoughtful. When they get three rate cuts in or more uh, this year, as I expect it will. Expect very probably a rate cut this year, but the question of the season is a premature one. Some of the highlights there from our conversations at last week's World Economic Forum in Davos.
Okay, let's take a look at how we're tracking on markets this uh, Monday morning in the Asia Pacific uh, here in Australia. We've been up and running now for just over 30 minutes and we're seeing a bit of uh, positivity for the ASX, better now by half of 1%. Uh, pretty much every sector in the green, uh, the only exceptions being uh, materials and uh, energy. Uh, the heavyweight financial sector doing pretty well, better by nine tenths of 1% right now. New Zealand also in positive territory and we've got uh, S&P futures uh, pointing up as well. Uh, after a risk on close to the week in the US. Annabelle. Yeah, well, Paul, uh, moving to, to the tech space now because Bloomberg's learned that Australian software company Canva is close to completing a share sale that's set to raise over $1.5 billion. Let's get more on this now, Bring in our Asia Tech senior reporter, Yulim Lee. So, Yulim, tell us a little bit more about this round. We know it was a secondary transaction. That's right. Um, so Canva is in the final stages of uh, closing uh, secondary uh, transaction totaling about $1.5 billion. It is uh, not new capital. Uh, essentially, it is for um, allowing uh, existing uh, uh, investors and employees and current employees and former employees to cash out. Um, this is in consistency with uh, the company's uh, policy for a long time to allow a lot of people to exit if they want to, giving them opportunity to cash out um, as the company grows. Um, this is uh, one of the biggest uh, secondary transactions in tech sector we have seen in recent years. Um, uh, Canva has been a little bit of our liar uh, in its Asia Pacific. It has been profitable since 2017 in cash flow basis, um, and they have uh, really escaped the uh, the downturn in a big way. Even though the valuation has been declining since uh, uh, a few years ago. When when it hit $40 billion. But um, the company this time was able to raise new fund um, at a 26 valuation, which is uh, similar to earlier last year. And yeah, of course, Canva isn't listed, but uh, we often discuss it as, uh, well, it's a potential for an IPO. What can you tell us about those plans and its business performance? Sure. Um, the company has been embracing AI in a big way in recent years. It's a 10-year-old company founded by um, Melanie Perkins and, uh, and Cliff. And they have been trying to really go to the next stage um, as they hit the 10-year mark. And, uh, you know, they have been upping the game against companies like Adobe. And obviously, um, they are, you know, doing well. They're, uh, according to our source, their annual revenue has hit, uh, you know, two billion dollars um, in an annual light basis last year, uh, which is an increase from the previous year. And they are able to increase their user base consistently. We understand that their um, monthly users are now 170 million people in 190 countries. So they are, um, you know, on track to really hit their mark. Um, and all this, you know, allows people to think that. But they are a very good potential uh, candidate for uh, public going public in this climate. But the company has been tight-lipped about it. Uh, our sources have told us there, there are new developments. And this uh, new uh, secondary transaction is not really related to the IPO. But it remains to be seen. All right, Asia. OK, Asia Technology Senior Reporter Yulim Lee there. You're watching Daybreak Australia. Here are some of the other stories that we're following around the world. Russia says Ukrainian shelling has killed at least 25 people near the Russian-controlled city of Donetsk. A local Moscow-backed official says the attack hit a busy market and shopping area on the city's outskirts. Russia wants the UN Security Council to discuss the incident later on Monday, calling it a treacherous attack on civilians. Russia's air transport agency says a rescue team has found survivors at the scene of a private jet crash in northern Afghanistan. Officials say four of the six people aboard the plane were injured but alive. The Moroccan-registered Dassault jet was uh, operating as an air ambulance flying from Thailand to Moscow. 
Hundreds of thousands of Germans rallied in major cities across the weekend to protest against far-right extremism and the rise of the anti-immigrant AFD party. A large crowd gathered in front of the German parliament in Berlin on Sunday. The days of protests followed revelations that the AFD and the main opposition Christian Democrats had discussed a so-called remigration scheme echoing Nazi policies of the 1930s. Annabelle. Well, Paul, the World Economic Forum has wrapped up in Davos. The last panel summarised that the world is finding an uneasy equilibrium. Yes, there, there could be a more benign economic backdrop, but that's being overshadowed by a range of geopolitical risks, and that includes US-China tensions. The US-China relationship is the central axis of tension when you look at the largest problems we face in the world. And it has to be refashioned into the central axis of partnership. They look at each other fundamentally as adversaries, and then they look for opportunities to cooperate within that framework. It has to be flipped around. Fundamentally, they have to be partners, because the challenges that they both face are the same. Climate change, a lack of global order, a breaking up of the global trading system. The challenges that both of them face and both of them will suffer for it. And the two are absolutely essential to any solution to climate, to peace, and to an open global trading system. And then within that, you can argue, you can badger, you can ensure fair competition, you can ensure that there's a way of dealing with each other that's consistent with the principles of openness and fair play. But we've got to flip things around where you're not fundamentally adversaries to one where you're fundamentally partners and then you argue about specifics. That's the fundamental repositioning that's required. So it's not just about a pause in the relationship, it's really about a repositioning in the relationship. If we move it forward, there are three, four pillars that we need to put in place to foster growth. And I don't know whether this year there will be a lot of distractions that keep us further away from that goal, but what would you focus on to bring back longer sustainable growth? With respect to, to um, what are the pillars we should look at for restoring growth, I think that's a very good conversation because we focus a lot on the pessimistic things that might happen. But there are some bright shoots um, that I want to talk about on the trade side. First, I want to mention that in spite of all the uncertainties that uh, we talk about and I pointed to in the beginning, trade has been largely resilient. It is because of trade that Europe was able to find other sources of energy. Uh, um, from the U.S. and the Gulf and elsewhere to make up for uh, the uh, you know, withdrawal of energy from, from Russia. It's because of trade that 35 countries dependent on the Black Sea region from Africa were able to find alternative sources of grain fertilizer. So trade has been a force for resilience. And there are some bright spots uh, in, in, in trade uh, that we need to be, be conscious of. There's digital trade and services trade has, is growing fast, especially digitally delivered services trade, growing at 8% per annum. And that is a very, very interesting thing because now we're all talking of digital platforms, AI, and this is a positive sign. And we should be preparing ourselves to say, how do we support such trade? How do we make sure that it benefits small and medium enterprises, women, those at the margin. Um, green trade has tripled from 2000 to now, tripled in, in value to $1.9 trillion. That's another opportunity. And finally, I want to say that the reshaping of supply chains, I see that as an opportunity and not a challenge. 
That was Singapore's president and the WTO director general among those panellists at the final Davos panel. Be sure to tune in to Bloomberg Radio to hear more from the day's big newsmakers and get in-depth analysis from the Daybreak team broadcasting live from our studio in Hong Kong. You can listen via the app Radio Plus or BloombergRadio.com. Plenty more ahead. Stay with us. It is time for Japan Ahead on Daybreak Asia. Gigi is reporting that a Japanese business delegation will be visiting Beijing from Tuesday. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's cabinet approval rating has dropped by one point to 24 percent. That's according to the latest Yomiuri Shimbun poll. And the Secretary General of the ruling LDP says the party should exercise more control over its internal factions as public anger over the slush fund scandal undermines support. Yeah, Paul, that political turmoil, just one possible risk factor for Japanese equities. But broadly, you can see here with futures, we're setting up for some more gains. You've got the Wall Street closed, very positive day for tech in particular. These expectations, the Fed is going to be cutting rates. You're also being boosted there by a weaker Japanese yen trading at the 148 mark. A lot of positive factors for Japanese equities. Again, that weaker currency. You've got corporate governance reforms that are still being issued. And there's, there's more more positive signals or some of the more positive signals in the economy and part of that is coming from the travel numbers as well because Japan welcomed 25 million tourists in 2023 that was the largest number we'd seen since 2019 again helped in part by the weaker Japanese currency it is a key boost for the economy that shrank in the middle of last year at the sharpest pace since the height of the pandemic so let's get more perspective on the outlook for tourism in Japan and go now to our chief North Asia correspondent Steve Engel in Tokyo, who's joined by our next guest, Steve. Hey, thanks a lot, Bell. Of course, uh, the Japanese uh, economy is doing well on the backs of tourism numbers, as you just rightfully said, the highest number in 2023 of 25 million since 2019. Fewer than 2019's uh, 32 million, but the travelers that are coming here from South Korea, Taiwan, even China, even though Chinese numbers are down from pre-pandemic levels, they are spending more per capita than 2019. It's all good for signs pointing for 2024 and beyond. Let's get a take on that from Agoda's uh, North Asia Associate Vice President Hiroto Oka. Thanks so much for Thank joining you, us here. Thank you. So what really stands out to you to these numbers? Obviously in Japan during the pandemic it was a domestic focused mm -hmm. tourism boom. Many mm -hmm. people could go to uh, Hirafu, Niseko, the domestic uh, skiers. Uh, now international inbound with that weak yen is really boosting that, isn't it? Yes. And uh, like in numbers, like if you like a searches for inbound uh, to Japan, we're seeing about 90% uh, uh, increase in uh, searches uh, compared to 2019 uh, uh, pre-pandemic level. So that's a pretty good uh, uh, number that we see. How much of all of this is attributed to the weak yen right now? It averaged 140.5 to the U.S. dollar last year. It's now 148 uh, and change, so considerably weaker. How much is that boosting, obviously, inbound travel? Uh, it's just a difficult question to answer because uh, we haven't done uh, the kind of impact analysis. However, uh, I do have there, there is uh, somewhat of an impact. But even if you look at the outbound from Japan, we're even still seeing an, uh, close to an 80 percent increase uh, in searches, which means that not just the Japanese yen, but the travel overall, I think it's coming really back after the uh, pandemic. You would think it would be the opposite because they have exactly. less spending power abroad exactly. in places like the U.S. where there's been inflation for many years, exactly. but you're still seeing the numbers and the bookings go up for Ex outbound. Exactly. Do you expect that to continue? Yes, uh, we do. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And as far as what are the changes that Agoda and other travel services online have seen through the pandemic and into this year, what are the trends that, you're most, that stand out to you most? Overall? Yeah. Over in the industry, we are seeing a lot more of the online travel, uh, online booking, 
uh, compared to uh, other uh, ways to uh, book. Are you so talking about the, the, the industry? The Japanese customer here, who have usually used travel agents like JTB, exactly, and, and traditional ways. You're seeing a definite shift to the online. Yes, that's yeah. one. And second is uh, that uh, we've been working on localization in the Japan market, and and because of that, uh, we're seeing more and more. Well, actually, uh, number wise. I, we, I, t I talked about uh, inbound and outbound uh, search numbers. However, if you look at the domestic uh, number, which is Japanese people or people living in Japan, traveling to other places in Japan, that's about more than 300% per increase compared to pre-pandemic last yeah. year, just last year. So what kind of changes did you actually see in the pandemic? Because I noticed that there are more ryokan, which are the traditional mm -hmm. Japanese inns, on your website and other online travel bookings. That didn't used to be the case. You'd have to get the, the regular Prince exactly. Tokyo Hotel yes, or something yes, yes. like that. So there's more options now. That's something that definitely changed over the last four years? It's because of the pandemic and there was no inbound uh, during that time. Uh, so I go to focus totally on localization uh, for the domestic travelers, which means more yokans, more hot spring areas, and more uh, customization of the features that we have. For example, uh, in Japan, when you book a yokan or even a hotel, you want to make sure that your family uh, gets the best service, which means do you have a yeah. good child wait for the, f the child? Do you have a different meal for your kids? Uh, and do you also have a specific bed for a baby? So those are things uh, that's very Japanese specific that we make sure that we can actually uh, customize within our website. What are the best technological advances that you've seen? Because electronic payments have surged around the yes. world. Japan is a cash heavy market, also credit cards for people coming abroad. But again, sometimes these online payment services, whether it's Alipay, WeChat Pay, or other Western ones, of course, don't necessarily work as well across borders. What are you doing to mitigate that? We're adding, uh, for Japan, Japan, we're adding uh, payments, uh, more optional payments, uh, such as mobile payments. And not only in Japan, but uh, globally, uh, that's one of our focus, at being able to have more uh, mobile payments and payment options to the consumers. That's definitely one of the focus that we have as an Agoda. All right. So 2024, it's going to be a good year. So this trend's going to continue. Absolutely. Inbound and outbound. Yes. All right. Uh, Hiroto Oka, thanks so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank uh, you. From Thank Agoda. You okay. Back to you from the Tokyo studio. All right, thanks very much, Steve. Our Chief North Asia Correspondent, Stephen Engel, there in Tokyo. And you can catch Japan Ahead every week. That is on Monday, 8.40 a.m. If you're watching in Tokyo, 7.40 p.m. Sunday in New York. Bloomberg subscribers can watch us live on the terminal using the TV Go function. This is Bloomberg. Well, the global chip outlook remains in focus this week with holiday quarter earnings from SK Hynix due on Thursday. South Korea's second most valuable company is expected to post a 35% revenue jump as AI adoption picks up. Let's get more from our breaking news earnings specialist, Rachel Yeo. So, Rachel, in that earnings for SK Hynix, what are some of the key things that we need to be watching out for? Right, so SK Hynix, uh, because of the global pickup in AI and also more demand in chips, we are expecting to see higher quarterly revenue from them. Uh, in terms of their 4Q sales, they might edge out more than their peers due to its dominant market share in uh, HBM chips, which are like high bandwidth memory chips that are used in generative AI. Uh, in terms of DRAM sales, they will also see more sales for that as well due to inventory restocking and a uh, a pickup in smartphone demand in uh, China as well. Uh, there's also higher average selling prices for DRAM too. Yeah. Well, uh, Nidec and Hyundai Motor are also going to be reporting earnings later on this week. Uh, what can we expect there? Mm. Uh, for Hyundai, we are expecting to see profits surge year on year due to their overall contribution in uh, from various segments. But there are still some concerns that sliding cars, the years long sliding car sales in China may still impact some of uh, their earnings. So that also highlights the uh, uh, the company's challenge to edge out in the world's largest auto market as well. And for Nidec, 
uh, we're expecting to uh, see the company maintain stable profit on advanced motors. Uh, their small precision motor and their, autom their automotive unit should remain solid, although we are expecting to see a loss in electric vehicle motors. All right, breaking news. Earnings specialist Rachel Yeo there. Thanks for joining us. Now, these are the stocks we're going to be watching when trade opens in Korea and Japan shortly. We'll be monitoring shares of Sony as we await any updates on its merger deal with Z Entertainment. The Indian company said late on Friday it was committed to the merger and was discussing a deal extension date with Sony. Plus, keep an eye on South Korea's battery makers following news that they're keen to develop processing plants in Chile to supply the U.S. market. All right, we've been trading here in Australia for uh, coming up on one hour now. Let's take a look at how we're doing. Uh, pretty much higher across the board, really. We're up by about half of 1% right now. Most of the sectors on the ASX are in positive territory. It's information technology, consumer discretionary stocks leading the way, but the heavyweight financial sector also doing pretty well, better by about nine-tenths of 1% right now. Not a lot of change to the Aussie dollar there, just hovering below 66 cents U.S. Uh, we do, of course, have market opens coming up, as I mentioned, in Japan and South Korea. Uh, futures uh, pretty much in positive territory for the Nikkei at the moment. And the Nikkei, of course, uh, just a few, about 100 points away from uh, eclipsing the high that we saw way back in 1990. All right, coming up in the next hour, we're going to have more market analysis with UBP. Hear why they're bullish on U.S. tech, but cautious on China and other emerging markets. Also, we're going to preview this week's Bank of Japan decision with Moody's Analytics. But of course, the market opens in Seoul and Tokyo. Up next, this is Bloomberg.